Okay, so uh, welcome to today's uh, webinar. Um, just to um, introduce you uh, to myself here, the webinar today here is uh, called Simplified Technical English, and basically, specifically with regards to, uh, in case you have an S1000D or ATA iSpec 2200 implementation, but I'll discuss Simplified Technical English in general as well. But I'll emphasize a little bit today on uh, what uh, what it entails whenever you have that particular uh, requirement. Just a brief um, introduction about myself for those who don't know me. Uh, my name is Barry Braster. I'm the uh, Director of Sales for Technical Documentation Services at, um, at Ediplan. Uh, you can see my contact information right there below my picture. And then uh, you see some information from me on the, uh, on the right-hand side. But I've basically been in the tech pub industry for over 15 years now. Um, I have a background in regulatory affairs quality assurance. Um, and in the end, I've managed uh, many uh, simplified technical English uh, implementations uh, worldwide um, for different industries, for different companies, a lot of them in aerospace and defense, but also quite a few of them uh, in, in other industries like uh, medical, automotive, uh, machinery, and even banking and finance, for that matter. Um, so how today webinars works, it uh, should be about 45 minutes or so, including uh, questions and, uh, and answers. Um, um, the audio should be provided through your PC, so you can also call in uh, if needed. Um, the webinar will be recorded, as I mentioned earlier, and in case you would like a recording of the session afterwards, you can request a link from me afterwards. Uh, Barry.braster at edaplan.com is, um, is my email address. You all will be in listen-only mode, so in case you do have any questions, you can answer them in the question box here on your right hand side so that should be in the user interface of the GoToWebinar software. Uh, where I can I will try to answer the questions during the webinar itself but most likely I will wait for them depending on how many there are uh, uh, I will wait for them to be answered to, uh, towards, the, uh, towards the end. Okay so uh, very good. So there's no questions at the meantime. So I'm going to assume um, that uh, we all have a good visual uh, of my screen. Um, in case not, then feel free to uh, to raise your hand. So a, a very brief update about Ediplan. Uh, we basically are a service provider in the field of engineering and technical documentation. Uh, as an industry, um, uh, we are mostly helping out uh, manufacturers in the aerospace, defense, and heavy equipment, industrial equipment industries, but that doesn't mean that we don't do other things as well. So we're also quite heavily involved in medical devices um, and, and other, uh, uh, well, types of industries, really. Um, 2,500 employees at the moment and growing, uh, not only uh, because uh, um, we uh, help more and more companies around the world, but also because we do quite a few acquisitions, uh, two of which took place uh, only two weeks ago, and I'll give you a quick update about that in a second. Uh, but out of those 2,500 employees, there's about 2,000 that are in engineering, and then that means that the rest are approximately 450 at the moment are documentation specialists. So in case you are, and I assume most of you are in technical documentation, either an author or a manager, or maybe in a different form. Um, we are like you, but with a different roof overhead. So we have 450 folks writing, illustrating, managing, publishing documentation on a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. We're a publicly uh, listed firm, which also allows me to share the uh, revenue with you in case you are interested in doing that. But 58 offices at the moment, most of them reside in Finland, where our headquarters are, but Sweden, Germany, the Netherlands, uh, which I'm currently giving this webinar from, uh, Poland, we have representation in, in Russia. Uh, so it actually should read representation, uh, Barry, not representation. Uh -huh. um, three offices in China, and uh, we're in uh, the United States uh, as well. So if you need any contact details of in any of those specific countries, let me know, and I'll be happy to forward those to you. Now, a very brief update about a recent uh, acquisition uh, we did. Um, we uh, are, were originally 2,100 employees, and then, well, actually a little bit more, but uh, uh, about two weeks ago, we concluded uh, an uh, integration of two companies by the names of Espotel and uh, Sorkea, both of them with offices in Finland uh, and Poland. 
And in essence, what they do is uh, they provide services uh, with regards to embedded systems, but it's very heavily linked to the industrial internet, so the internet of things. So that means is that um, as Adaplan, we are now also able to extend uh, our expertise to include uh, industrial internet, internet of things uh, as well. So that basically, if I give you a simple example, if you, for instance, uh, uh, build coffee makers as an example, then not only will the service information that comes with that or an installation manual where you can read how to make coffee, but it can actually read how much water is in there whenever you are filling up the, um, the coffee maker with, uh, uh, with beans, for instance. Um, uh, all of these things will be able to, uh, to, be, to be read and then giving feedback to the end user in case they need to do any type of either, you know, uh, whether they need to make a cup of coffee or whether they need to maintain the machine. That's just a very simple example, but you can imagine what that would mean for very large industrial machines like forklift trucks or, or machinery, aircraft, uh, etc. So that means that with regards to uh, heavy equipment, uh, we're able to basically make the circle round with embedded systems, with engineering services, with an analysis of system integration, uh, all of these things combined, in essence. So, okay. So, uh, and then you know, brief information about these are the type of clients uh, that we that we service, um, which gives you an introduction. You basically, you know, a bit of an impression on the large variety of customers that we that we service uh, worldwide. A lot of airspace and defense, a lot of heavy equipment, but there's also quite a number of companies in there in the medical field, heavy or heavy uh, consumer electronics, I should say. Um, etc. etc. So today's webinar topic. I'm going to be talking to you about STE, Simplified Technical English. If you have an S1000D or ATI Spec 2200 um, um, requirement, what does that entail? Or maybe that you expect that requirement to come up soon. We'll start by introducing or, or explaining what S1000D is. It's it's uh, if you're in in airspace and defense, this will probably very much ring a bell. But it's an international specification which in essence is designed to cover technical publication activities in support of any platform. So it started out only as a, um, a platform for, uh, for aircraft, but now it, then it got expanded to uh, uh, sea and, and land uh, as well. And currently at uh, issue 4.1, yes, it's over 3,500 pages. You can actually download it for free by going to s1000d.org. And it allows information to be exchanged easily. Uh, basically, if all the different suppliers um, that Airbus or Boeing or anyone else has, um, you know, they sometimes use up to 50 to 200 different suppliers, then of course we cannot provide all PDF files. The information needs to be exchanged uh, um, um, quite easily. And, and for that, a standard like S1000D really helps whenever you have an uh, um, a machine uh, that needs to be maintained for the next 10, 15, 20 years or so, then having a standard like this in place is going to really help out. So, and that also means that you know Airbus, Boeing, Mitsubishi, uh, uh, Comac uh, uh, in, in China, Irkut in Russia, and other OEMs have selected S1000D as the spec to be uh, to be used uh, for technical documentation. So. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, reuse I mentioned, so if you're familiar with the XML, uh, principle of XML is basically information that will be created once, can then be reused multiple times, and then can also be published multiple times. So it allows for information to be much easier to be managed, much easier to be and faster to be found by your end users, like uh, service engineers, for instance, and it also allows you to publish your information to different formats, so not only PDF, but also HTML, interactive HTML, even augmented reality. And I mentioned already, if you have different suppliers, it's important that you have or that you facilitate data exchange. That's as for S1000D. The uh, iSpec 2200 by ATA is basically the same thing, but for commercial activities, even though S1000D is also being used for commercial aircraft like the uh, A380 and, uh, and uh, the 787, uh, by Boeing, and then the first one was Airbus, of course. Um, where ATA iSpec 2200 
is objective is to minimize the cost and effort expended by the operators and the OEMs, so the original equipment manufacturers, to improve the information quality and timelessness and to assure that manufacturers provide data that meets the airline operational needs. So that means that the user information for pilots is also included there and needs to adhere to that particular specification. Um, now, is there then an STE 100 requirement? So simplified technical English for aerospace and defense is known as ASD STE 100, formerly known as IICMA, simplified English. Uh, ASD stands for aerospace and the European Aerospace and Defense uh, Industries. As a matter of fact, I say European, but really it's a global body because they work together with organizations around the world, um, including the US, uh, and other countries uh, uh, which comprise the, the working group that uh, that are behind this 1000D. Uh, but in essence, what it's what's important for you to know is that in case you do find an S1000D or an ATI spec 2200 requirement, that you check your contract uh, to make sure that there indeed is a simplified technical English, or in this case, an ASD STE 100 requirement. In uh, S1000D, it's uh, ruled out. Uh, it's ruled as such under 2.1, uh, what the language needs to be. It's recommended to use uh, simplified technical English and also check the, the business rule for it. So the contract should uh, help you state so. Now, what this may mean to you in case you do not have S1000D, ATI spec or simplified technical English content. Um, well, uh, the inability, of course, to deliver the required uh, technical documentation. Um, the fact that everyone else is doing it, well, preference will be given to them. You may not even be qualifying for future uh, tender opportunities. You may even lose your supplier standards, st status. So, and with compliant data, you're able to further optimize, optimize the deliverable, uh, delivery of, of technical uh, documentation. Of course, maintain your compliance as a supplier and even access new industries because um, Really, S1000D and the other one as well, but mainly S1000D is really going places. It's being used more and more in industries outside uh, aerospace and defense. To give you an example, there's initiative for uh, railroad uh, uh, OEMs, um, uh, like train manufacturers, for instance, and uh, they took S1000D as a basis for it. That's called Raildex, and in the offshore and shipping industry, um, there is a... Uh, they took S1000D and renamed it to ShipDex and, and used whatever information they wanted to use and left everything out that was not applicable to them. Um, and you may be the first to market in, in those industries as well. Um, so, yes, uh, just to quickly make sure there's no questions. No, very good. Um, so what is Simplified Technical English then? Well, um, oh, go one back. Uh, I mentioned already it's, it's an official specification. So if you're aerospace and defense, you can refer to that standard. If you're not, then you can actually use STE as a basis for your controlled language needs. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. But in essence, what it is, it has uh, approximately 60 writing rules that are basically telling you to keep things simple, to be specific, and to be consistent. So um, to be simple, meaning that, you know, you keep to one topic per sentence. To be specific means if you're telling someone that, for instance, the pressure must be okay. Well, what does okay mean? You know, it uh, could mean 20 degrees. It could mean 90 degrees. What may be okay for you may not be okay for someone else. Don't stack these boxes too high. Well, if they're 500 pounds a piece, you may want to tell people if it's two or five boxes. And then, of course, to be consistent with the terminology that you use. So don't call... Uh, uh, you know, don't call something 20 different names if you can just call it that one name and use that consistently. And if you can't really check who, what other writers are doing, then really you need a form of making sure that everyone uses the same terminology. Uh, and that's kind of with regards to standardizing terms, right? One word can only have one meaning. So if you have one word that has multiple meanings or if you have multiple words that have the same meaning, um, you know, in the world of controlled language, that's not really uh, a, a good thing to do because if something is not clear to the end user, dangerous things can happen. So um, the spec comes with a core dictionary that has about 3,000 words, uh, but there's hardly any technical nouns in there. Um, so that means that if you are going to implement STE, you're going to have to build a dictionary that sits on top of the 
uh, core dictionary that includes your corporate slash company uh, uh, vocabulary. And they need to be standardized. So you just can't, you know, extract all the terms in your company and approve all of them. Um, you need to, again, differentiate between which words have actually one meaning, uh, which words are used statistically the most times, and then which words are really only the synonyms to other words and should therefore be not approved. Um, what is SD address? Well, safety, obviously. But we have to realize that with safety, we also have to realize that information is becoming more complex, right? Over the last 30, 40 years, you know, we, we, we started out with something that was able be to, to be described on one page that we now really need, you know, 20 pages to describe the same thing because it's basically the products have become much more complex. Um, for maintenance information, there are really massive volumes. You know, the, the, you know, the 787 is, is currently the, what is it, the 8th, 9th, or maybe 10th aircraft in line, and then there's different versions of that, you know, uh, the 300, the 200 of each version. So, and with each aircraft, there comes a maintenance manual. Well, we're talking about a lot of pages here, really a lot, thousands and thousands. Um, so, you know, what are you going to do when something goes wrong? You're going to give your uh, end user, the service engineers, you know, pallets full of, of documentation. That's not really going to work. So. Um, then you, of course, depending, I mean, it's a global market, so you will very likely have separated globally and geographically separated service centers. Um, well, global world means a lot of non-native English speakers, maybe even inexperienced maintenance personnel, various levels of technical skills, therefore a risk of misunderstandings. What may be clear to you may not be clear to others. Uh, liability issues. Um, shorter response times that are required by the market, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And all of those issues are addressed by STE. Uh, now, since we're, we're talking about uh, aircraft airlines, I uh, wanted to mention this um, uh, uh, quote from the, uh, uh, the International Civil Aviation Association, where they say that standardization of language used by maintenance personnel has become increasingly necessary because of substantial changes in maintenance practices in the past 20 years. So there's an expansion of role of computers in, in, in the maintenance environment, fewer translations of documents uh, from English to a native language, um, increased use of manufacturer generated standardized training material in English, more alliances amongst airlines, you know, one is merging with the other, and then if they have the same information, you can't really um, merge them and expect them to, uh, to be fine or, or use one and then expect them, you know, the maintenance cards of, um, formerly continental to be easily being used by United Airlines. Uh, increasingly mobile cultural workforce uh, is also uh, in there. So that was a quote from the ICAO. And then some examples about how, you know, small things can have very big and un very unfortunate consequences. I'm not going to ask you to read uh, through all of this, but basically a lot of these things, uh, and this is, again came from the Aviation Institute of Maintenance, could have been prevented these situations if um, 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 if if the language was uh, was basically uh, better uh, dealt with. Um, also, just to show you some more show you some more examples that a small error can have very big consequences. But you know, a uh, major airline had to ground their fleets because there was one tiny little mistake in the maintenance cards. A power transformer company had a big lawsuit because of the badly worded and confusing documentation. And then even a company like Google, uh, um, the largest problem for them is that 35% uh, uh, of all reported issue had to deal with translation and language issues. So just to kind of show you that something very small can have very big consequences. And I'm actually going to give you some uh, nice examples uh, uh, for that uh, in a moment. So the questions that we need to consider, right, is, is do we communicate clearly and efficiently? And if we say that we do, well, how can we be sure? So, for instance, do we have a terminology list um, that everyone uses consistently so there's no confusion by your end user if you're going to, so that you will not call one item several names? Uh, is there a style guide in place? And if you have a terminology list and if you have a style guide, well, how do we measure against those two? Um, and if they're not, then that answers, uh, that answers that question quite easily, right? So the, the 
And then the, the last part I want to mention here is that, you know, are, are we efficient and cost-effective information developers? And the reason why I'm saying information developers instead of authors is because a lot of times it's not just technical authors who are writing the documentation, it's also engineers that write the documentation. And it's quite logical for them to write or being asked to write the documentation because they know most about your products. Um, however, technical authoring is really a different discipline from, from engineering. Uh, so there, there comes really, it's quite the craft really if, if you're looking at it. Uh, in, in, for instance, in a country like Germany, there's actually an official um, certificate that you can get for technical authoring at the universities. Um, so, you know, that and, and of course the fact that engineers should be engineering. They should not be writing which means there's a little bit of capital waste going on uh, in that regard. And you see this one guy over here writing for different types of end users. Well, we have to realize that if this guy, for instance, is located in Europe, and let's say that he's in Germany, as an example, which is a non-native English-speaking country, and he has to write in English, why not in German? Well, he could write from German, and write, it, write in German, but if he has to translate his documentation into multiple languages, then it's actually much more cost effective to first translate from or first translate from German to English and then go from English to all the other countries to all the other languages in the world. Why? Because German to Chinese language translators are harder to find and therefore they're more expensive, but English to Chinese is much easier to find and therefore people used to or usually go from one language to a main language and then use that main language which is usually English to all the other languages but if there's um, if there's ambiguity in the source then ambiguity will stay in the next language and will probably get even worse in the follow-up languages so there's there's writers who have a different technical background who have a different language background and who may also have a different cultural background and then write for an end user a global end user that may also have a different language, cultural, or technical background. And how do we how do we deal with that? Well, we deal with that by by applying the three C's, right? And I mentioned this because the three C's is kind of easy to remember. So the first C stands for clarity. The second one for being concise. You know, write things in, in sh like make your make your sentences like one topic per sentence. So be be very much to the point and stick with the need to know information and not so much with the nice to know. And then write consistent. You know, if you're going to call it a, a, a cup or a mug, well, then call it a cup everywhere else and not, and not you know, use different terms while you're talking about the same thing. Um, realizing also that English is more complex than you think. I mean, most uh, people in the world speak English, even though it's not the most spoken language in the world. Uh, even uh, like Chinese and Spanish are actually number one and two. Um, but we have to realize that English actually is from a uh, you know, global communication, from an international communication point of view, is the number one language. However, it's a very difficult language. It has over one million words. Um, according to the Oxford Dictionary, actually, the 500 words most used in the English language each have an average of 23 different meanings. And if you look at simple words, like at least I regard them as simple, set, run, go, take, and stand, every single one of them has more than 334 different definitions. So, a little bit, a few examples, and I want to give to you. Uh, be specific. I'm going to try to be humorous here, but when we are being vague to our end user, well, they're going to be vague back against us. So, if the pilot, which usually, you know, the pilot reports something, and then the service engineer has to, you know, take that report uh, and, 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 and reply to make sure that he has dealt with the situation. If the pilot says, left inside main tire almost needs replacement, you cannot expect anything else and the engineer saying, well, then I almost replaced the left inside main tire, right? So if you're telling the end user something loose in the cockpit, they will tell you, well, we tightened something in the cockpit. You say evidence of leak on right main landing gear. They say, well, we remove the evidence because what means evidence? The DME volume unbelievably loud. All right, well, DME volume set to a more believable level. And then the last and my favorite one is aircraft handles funny. Aircraft is being warned to straighten up, fly right, and be serious. 
Um, next, I uh, want to tell you that short is not always good, right? So if we have this sentence, turn off engines not required, and for those of you who have witnessed more of my uh, webinars, uh, I usually make this sentence come back every once in a while, but it can mean turn off. Uh, I, I'm sorry, it could mean two different things. It could mean turn off those engines that are not required. So let's say that you have four engines and you only need to turn off two. It could also mean Turning off the engines is not required at all. It could actually mean two different things. And we've actually done a survey amongst a lot of people. And it uh, turns out that 60% uh, uh, regarded the first sentence as the correct one and 40% the other one. Um, what was the true answer, in fact, doesn't really matter anymore. This was the first one, by the way. But it doesn't really matter because the fact that 40% regarded this as um, uh, the different meaning, the second meaning, means that you have a potential problem there. And you can almost see that in case you do have a requirement for it to translate, and this sentence is being translated in over, you know, 20, 30 different languages going worldwide, well, no one's going to be able to guarantee that uh, this particular um, sentence was uh, translated with the correct meaning in, for instance, uh, Chinese. Some questions uh, uh, are coming in, but I will save those to the end, if that's okay with you. Um, so, now looking at it briefly from an IT point of view, because uh, in case you do have an, a content management system, uh, or a, a component content management system, or a, uh, you know, a basically a shared database where all your information in there, then um, a common source database, as they call it in the world sometimes, uh, this is all great. You can have all your information being S1000D compliant. You can work in XML. You can work with all these wonderful things and then being able to publish all your information, you know, in, as an interactive viewer to your end user or simply as PDF or print everything or do this for e-learning. However, your end user is not really going to matter. So all of these things are great from a creation, publication and management point of view, but your end user actually is only going to read this text right here. And if you have no control over that, in other words, you have writers and engineers write different ways while they're all trying to say the same thing, like turn off the engines is not required, or ensure you turn off the engines, or put the engines in the off position. There's like a hundred different ways of saying this, then that's what your end user is going to read. So you can have the best content management system in the world. You can be able to publish to all these different multiple publication outputs work with S1000D, be fully compliant, and then still your end users are not going to understand what you're trying to tell them because they only care about what they read, right? So short is not always good, right? So I mentioned one sample before. Well, I'll give you another one. Um, if you have something like this, if installed, comma, remove the guide rails. Now, what are we talking about here? I would say if I read this sentence, it means that I need to install the guide rails first before I remove them. And it makes sense because you can't remove anything before it's actually in place. However, if we now have this sentence in front of it, install a component, full stop, if installed, remove the guide rails. Okay, well now it's becoming a little unclear because if installed, do I now need to uh, make sure that the component is installed first before I remove the guide rails? Or do I actually need to make sure that the guide rails are installed. So it's now referring, it could refer both to, to the component as well as to the guide rails, right? And because we're shortening our sentences, this can mean, and if we write a certain way, this could mean ambiguity here. So the right way of doing it is, is saying that if the guide rails are installed, comma, remove them, because then you're first taking the subject of the sentence and then you're referring back to it. And then make people responsible for their actions. So if you're, and this is not the nicest example that I have here, of course, but it, it proves the point. So if you're saying a woman hits a man using a hammer, my question to you is who is holding the hammer? Could be both the woman, but it could also be the man, right? So it could be the woman hits the man with a hammer, but it could also mean the woman hits the man who is using a hammer, right? So meet, make people responsible for their actions. This is why you cannot use the gerund. So this is this ing form of, uh, of a verb. 
And, you know, another thing is that the bigger the product, the longer the sentence. So we saw this sentence once. Uh, it said, clean the third dome chassis win thermal window securing screw threaded holes. I almost uh, lose myself in pronouncing this sentence. And the thermal window 16 securing screws of all previously used sealant using solvent. Um, I went back to the engineer and I asked him, is this clear to you? And of course, it was perfectly clear to this person. However, if you're using, if you're reading this as an end user, you know, and it's usually the result of a big product and they want to refer that these, you know, that these holes are, are threaded and they belong to a window that belongs to a chassis and that, you know, uh, belongs to a third, a third dome, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to break up these types of words. You can't have long noun clusters that have more than three nouns in them, for instance. And by doing so and sticking with the need to know and getting rid of the nice to know, you get a sentence like this. Clean the 16 screws and the threaded holes of all sealant with solvent. Or you can even say full stop use solvent. Um, so we had a 48 production in, in words here and it's a lot clearer now. So steps for implementation. So what to do? Um, well, while you're doing your S1000D implementation, it would be a good idea to uh, to have a look at your content as well, just to see if it needs to be converted, if it needs to be rewritten, or in case you want to, uh, you may have to do that in case you have an STE requirement, or in case you in case you don't, may still want to do so, and then only start with new information to be STE compliant. In any case, writers, authors need to receive training. There are software tools out there in the world, of course, but training writers on the writing rules is very essential. Why? Because they need to understand necessarily how to write in simplified English, but also why it is necessary to do so. Um, secondly, you can't, software can't teach authors what is nice to know and what is need to know, uh, what is necessary to know. Training will help you do that. So. Thanks to the use of training, we were able, in, in, in addition to using software, we were able to reduce content by an additional 20%. So and I'll show you some statistics uh, later on. Secondly, standardize on terminology. So one word, one meaning, and do that on a corporate terminology level. What we would do as a service is we would extract the terms uh, from your documentation, obviously after signing an NDA. We would then determine what information uh, we need, so we would extract the terms. Uh, we would do a statistical analysis, a little linguistic analysis. We have uh, uh, highly skilled linguists uh, on board uh, out of those 450 uh, uh, documentation specialists uh, that can have this done for you within one month. And then thirdly, uh, quality control. And that's where we have a tool called Hyper STE. Uh, it sits on top of your authoring environment and it provides you with m m means of quality assurance, quality control, and it basically measures the content uh, to be compliant with either AZ ST100 or a subset of that in case you are not in aerospace and defense but are still interested in doing this for the right reasons. Um, it allows you to uh, go to the market much faster uh, because content will be much more reduced, Con therefore documentation costs will be reduced. As an author, you'll become more efficient, etc. A little bit about HyperSTE then. So it's a content quality checker. It supports style guides, standards for writing, so mil spec, uh, uh, other uh, specifications that you may have, uh, uh, controlled language uh, authoring. Optimizes your content by ensuring rules for terminology, spelling, grammar, style are all being met. It highlights the mistakes. I'll give you some samples in a moment. You can create quality assurance uh, reports. And uh, it's a plugin for Word, Arbitext, FrameMaker, InDesign, XMetal, XMax, etc., etc. So whatever you author in, it's very likely that it's uh, available as a plugin for that, so that you can immediately check your content within your authoring environment. The benefits, obviously, now you will comply with ACST 100 if you have that requirement. Um, but quality assurance, quality improvement, it will standardize not only. Uh, uh, with S1000D, you will standardize your structure. With uh, uh, Simplified English, you will standardize the content itself. Product safety, of course, is a very important one. Uh, reduce time to market. It will improve your user slash uh, customer experience. And if you do have a content management system, going back to that one uh, uh, picture that I showed to you earlier, well, now you're reusing quality content instead of quantity content. 
uh, documentation costs will go down and if you do have a translation requirement you can expect them to be a lot cheaper faster and much better in quality some of the references that we uh, work for in this regard uh, there's airlines uh, in there there's aerospace and defense OEMs uh, in there but there's also banking and financing companies uh, medical healthcare life sciences uh, technology companies forklift trucks garden equipment consumer electronics uh, many more and then uh, uh, you may Notice a company like UNICEF uh, down here. Yes, they have offices in every country in the world, and they also need to make sure that they uh, communicate very clearly. Then, of course, they don't have an STE requirement, but for them, we created a subset that did not have all the rules enabled, but that still allowed them to, uh, as a non-native English speaker, to another non-native English speaker, to still communicate quite uh, clearly. Some before and after examples then, uh, these are some airspace and defense examples, but uh, the FAA about them said that if manuals are ambiguous, we are all at risk. But from this case, we were able to, from aircraft manual, go for a 35% word reduction here. I'll show you some more examples right here. So um, on the left-hand side, some text, on the right-hand side, some photos. We, we don't want our authors and illustrators to use photos ever, because photos can be printed on black and white printers and then your photo is pretty useless after that. Secondly, it usually contains a lot of redundant information and thirdly, it's hard to maintain because if something gets updated, you're going to have to take a lot of new photos rather than just updating the uh, illustrations in a uh, XML slash CMS uh, um, managed uh, format. And if we look at the after, you can see one topic per sentence, very clear, very concise very consistent too with the words and the, ver and, and the, the verbs that we use here uh, and then using uh, simplified English illustrations which we have done a webinar about in the past and we'll do so again in the near future telling uh, or, or giving and specifically the combination gives us very clear information uh, on what to do uh, here the nice thing about these simplified illustrations here is that uh, we got rid of a lot of redundant information that made the engineer happy from an IT point of uh, IP point of view. Uh, it allowed for a lot more reuse, but also for the end user's point of view, they're much easier to understand. I'll give you a brief demo. And we have a few more slides left. Uh, so I'll use a, well, a couple more minutes. Uh, but if I show this to you in Arbitext, we have uh, HyperC sitting on top of that, so we can do an interactive check on this document. And then we can, and I'll increase the font size a little bit, but the word acceptable, for instance, uh, is uh, not acceptable uh, because it can have three different meanings, satisfactory, permitted, permitted, and serviceable. I'll click permitted and replace. Uh, MESC module, we see here, that's the company uh, Telabs, which is a telecommunication firm. They're telling me now that um, I need to um, replace this and I can do a replace all because it's a technical noun. So it will clean it up in the entire document. So you can do kind of a word by word replacement. It will give us some examples of um, what is right and what is wrong. So the words are color coded. If I go to the uh, settings, it gives us different rules for terminology and spelling and grammar and length and style. You have the ability to create your own profile, so you can turn on or turn off certain rules. You can even change the colors that belong to those rules uh, and completely configure or have us uh, uh, create this configuration uh, for you um, to uh, work with uh, HyperSD on your content. You can even load S1000D or ATI spec 2200 DTD in here, the tags in here, so you can do, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, a conditional checking so that if you have that for instance in s1000 these a certain rule that if you have a certain tag it needs to contain procedural rules or procedural text well now you can actually uh, apply that so you can apply descriptive versus procedural or only check for terms uh, or, or skip the uh, headings or tags uh, altogether all of these things are possible it's kind of a one-time setup and then you are good to go Regarding dictionaries, just to give you the flexibility, so there's a core dictionary, of course, that comes with the tool. On top of that sits the company dictionary that overrides the core dictionary. So in case you don't agree with some of the SDE words, then you can override them. And you can also work with project dictionary that sits on top of that. So they could be division, uh, they could be 
uh, a customer, uh, for instance, uh, when we did an implementation at Rolls Royce, they create engines for both aircraft, uh, for both Airbus and Boeing aircraft. Um, so whenever they would work for Boeing, they would work for according to the Boeing uh, dictionary, and whenever they would work for Airbus, they would work for with the Airbus dictionary. So just to give you a sample there, how easy it is uh, to customize the tooling around your particular needs. And then I'm able to create reports. I can do that on one file. I can do it on uh, multiple files. Um, you can create um, out of on thousands of pages. You can get feedback on how good or how bad you're doing, which is really good if you're talking about legacy content. And with S1000D, you usually have a lot of content that needs to be converted. Uh, so we have a compliance rating of 60%. In this case, we see there's quite a bit of blue in there. We are being told that we are doing uh, quite okay with the readability flash Kincaid grade. That's a, a, a U.S. school grade level a way of writing. So important for you guys in the States. Translatability, similarity, all of those different readings you can see uh, right here. Um, and if we are more interested in looking at the detailed results, there's this documents level right here that gives us all, that lists all the files that we just have checked. In this case, it's just one uh, XML file. Um, and then I can go to the blue color, which tells us that these words are all not approved. I can put them in an alphabetical order or in a high to low frequency order. And in case you have a few hundred pages that were checked, of course, you can look at the frequency order and you can see that the word should, you know, it may not be used, misused four times, but 400 times. Then it's quite easy to go back into the document and then start replacing should with must, can, or will. Um, and that's another rule. So should, may, might are not allowed in STE because in some cultures you will give people a choice. So if you tell someone that they should switch off the power, then you tell someone it's up to you. You have a choice. You can either do it or not. And that can, of course, have very dangerous consequences. If you want to see more from the demo side, then feel free to contact me. I'll be happy to organize uh, your own demonstration here. But we're going to keep things as informative as we can here. So a few more minutes. Uh, we did a survey, the users of uh, STE and Hyper STE, but we saw that was thanks to the training, dictionary building, and the use of the software, there's a 30% reduction in translation cost, 40% reduction in word count. We actually, initially, when we started out about uh, 13, 14 years ago, we aimed for 25%, but it turned out to be much more. So that was really good news. Quality improvement in writing and translations. 30% reduced product cycle time is mo for most of you who have already a simplified English requirement but are not using software. So with HyperST, you're able to uh, automate a lot of these handlings that you have. And in the case of one of our customers, uh, it helped them to reduce their labor cost by 30% as well as the time to market. Reduction in, in overall documentation costs right there. And through the reporting and the creation of profiles, you're able to get a very efficient conversion of, um, of existing documentation. A uh, few case studies, Rolls-Royce I mentioned already. So these are numbers given to us by Rolls-Royce. But for writers, they had 81% reduction of grammatical errors, 90% reduction in STE errors, 52% reduction in time to find the errors. And for quality assurance, it meant 48% reduction in time to review the documents and 25% increase in errors that were found. So quite nice. American Airlines, from an airline point of view, um, uh, we're doing implementations currently uh, uh, with KLM Air France as well, for that matter. I should say Air France KLM, sorry. Um, standardized documentation needed to get done there because uh, there was an issue with the maintenance cards and we helped them uh, standardize on, on their vocabulary and we trained all their authors and engineers to write in STE. And then last but not least, uh, for those who are not aerospace and defense, uh, this is the medical device company Electa. Uh, they had a translation budget uh, of close to a million dollars. And um, uh, thanks to the use of STE together with XML, there were savings uh, achieved of up to 40%. The uh, uh, cost, cost of goods sold was a 66% reduction, 30% page count reduction, 20% words count reduction. Uh, we went, actually went from a 1500 page manual of this uh, MRI machine to a 900 page uh, documentation. And as a result, um, uh, less people confused. A lot of people were happy with what they were reading, what they had to work with. And in, in essence, it was much easier to manage 
uh, access, integrate, and reuse the, uh, the content. So that concludes this webinar. Uh, before I open this up to uh, Q, uh, uh, questions, Q&A, before I open up the Q&A session, um, in case you want to receive a free health check of your content. So that means that uh, in case you are interested in having us have a look, it's completely complimentary, having a look at your content after signing an NDA, obviously, uh, we'll be more than happy to do that. It's, uh, again, absolutely free. Let us know. You can then also request this 112-page booklet that we see right here that gives us um, a historic background on STE, where it comes from, what it entails, who have done it, etc., etc. We only sell ourselves on the last two pages, so it's actually quite, uh, quite informative. Uh, in case you want to get more information, uh, feel free to drop me an email at barry.braster at edaplan.com. I'll be then be also be able to connect you with uh, local representation, uh, like for instance, uh, my colleague Mark Ogden in the United States, or my colleagues in Sweden or Finland or anywhere else, China for instance, where you may require local assistance. Okay, that leaves me to open up the questions. Uh, at the moment, let me see. Uh, quite a number of questions uh, by you, uh, Santil. Thank you very much. Uh, so you're saying, I'm just going to uh, read it out in full, if that's okay with you. So currently, do all the OEMs write their manuals um, uh, as per Simplified English as a strict uh, process? Um, no, not all of them are doing it. Uh, those who have a requirement, yes, they do it. But I can, if you mean with all the OEMs, like all the uh, original equipment manufacturers in the world, no, absolutely, they're not doing it. Uh, um, are, are, but it is a requirement in aerospace and defense, and uh, that means that all documentation in aerospace and defense, if you're talking about the 787 or military aircraft, indeed are all written in simplified English, or there's a very little, much of a legal requirement for them to do so. And then you say you mean very old written manuals, like some big books, like component maintenance manuals of the engine. Um, well, if there's a requirement, yes, they need to do so. So, uh, uh, yes, and in case not, then feel free to send us some samples, but uh, um, um, it's able to, uh, to help out there. So, and the question is, what is Hyper-STE? Uh, how does it different, uh, differentiate from ACST-100? Uh, well, HyperSD helps you to comply with ASD STE uh, 100, so it's a fully compliant software checker. However, if you do not have an ASD ST 100 uh, requirement because you're not in that particular industry, it's able you're able to use the controlled language edition of the software uh, that is configured to meet uh, other style guide needs, uh, uh, for instance. Um, so if you are not, if you do not have that particular A and D requirements, then we actually call it simplified technical English in general. But then we are no longer referring to ASD STE 100. Um, yes, uh, there is a recorded uh, version available. I'll be happy to send you a link. Uh, it will be available on YouTube a little later uh, today or tomorrow, and I'll be happy to forward it to everyone who will request a link uh, for that. Um, currently, we don't have any offices in India. Uh, the closest location would be China. Uh, we are actually do, I believe we do have plans to go to India at some point in time, but that's not something that we can reveal since we are a publicly listed firm. Um, but uh, yes, there you go. Any further questions by anyone while I take a sip of my tea? No further questions I see. Very good. In that case, I will close off the presentation, uh, but not before I thank everyone for uh, listening in. Um, please, again, let me know in case there are any questions, um, and then we are more than happy to uh, help you out. So for now, wishing you a good morning, uh, rest of the day, evening, because uh, there's quite a number of people from around the world. And um, we'll be uh, promoting more webinars uh, very shortly. And for now, I thank you very much for attending. Thanks. Bye-bye.